Drive It, the DW Car Show. Coming up, more safety in the new Volvo XC60. Fun on country roads in the Opel Adam S. And the new Porsche Panamera Sport Turismo. Has Porsche built a wagon? The company certainly doesn't use that term, but just look at the new Panamera Sport Turismo. But don't worry, it is still a Porsche through and through, brimming with power and luxury. We're testing the e-hybrid version with total system power output of 340 kilowatts. At up to 140 kilometers an hour, the plug-in hybrid can cover 50 kilometers entirely on electric power, producing no emissions locally. This is called e-power mode. On country roads, the Panamera 4E Hybrid makes a great impression. No wonder, it is clearly a touring car for business people. It just glides along. In electric mode, it's also extremely quiet. With its Sport Turismo, Porsche has found, one could say, invented a special niche within a niche market, namely a Supersport Premium segment wagon. 5.05 meters long and 1.93 meters wide, the Sport Turismo is an impressive sight. From the front to the B column, it's like the regular sedan. Then comes the elongated wagon style roof. Opinion is divided on whether it looks good or odd. The roof line ends in a three way adaptive spoiler. V6 hybrid developed by Audi purrs quietly in a smoky bass voice. Starting at about 3,000 RPM, the sound gets more exciting and eventually gives you goosebumps. So let's see what all that power really delivers. On the racetrack, there are a couple of sharp bends. That's a challenge for the Panamera. Four-wheel drive is standard in all versions of the Sport Turismo. This speedy wagon manages to be a sports car with room for all the family. Quite an achievement. On the racetrack, a car like this can demonstrate its true strengths. This one has the 3-litre V6 engine with 462 horsepower and maximum total system torque of 700 newton meters, which is marvelous for accelerating out of a curve. Just feel that thrust. On the highway, it can cruise at 270 kilometers an hour. Nought to 100 takes 4.6 seconds. Those 700 newton meters are there when you need them. There's no delay. The hybrid has no discernible weaknesses, except that the alleged average consumption of 2.6 liters per 100 kilometers is not realistic, even in everyday driving, let alone on the racetrack. As for handling, the steering is very precise. Obviously, this is a very sporty car. What's more, it has rear axle steering. So, for example, if you're heading to the right, the front wheels turn right and the rear ones turn a little to the left. That makes it extremely nimble. Brake, turn into the bend, downshift, floor it. At 6.8, shift up again. It's all very easy. Carbon fibre door sills and dashboard add to the sporty feel. The infotainment system has a huge touch screen. It's like being at the movies. There is room for two tall people and one small one in the rear. It's comfortable and access is easier now that the roof does not slope. These are the practical, family-oriented aspects of the car. Because of the hybrid technology, the trunk has shrunk by 95 litres, but if you fold down the rear seats, it encompasses a whopping 1,300 litres. 
We have a parallel layout. The electric motor is positioned between the internal combustion engine and the PDK gearbox. That means under all conditions, including all-wheel drive, the e-motor has the same access to the drivetrain components as the combustion engine has. Old-school Porsche fans probably regard wagon plus hybrid as just a distraction, incompatible with the traditional feel of a Porsche. But Klaus R. Tester sees it differently, and he used to be a racing driver. On the racetrack, this Panamera 4E hybrid is just a perfect car. Volvo's hit model XC60 has been on the road long enough, so it's time for a successor. Car tester Emmanuel Schaefer reports that the first generation Volvo XC60 was a global success. Over a million have been sold in total, making it the best selling luxury compact SUV in Europe for the past three years. Now the second generation has arrived and it has Volvo's new face, including its Thor's Hammer LED daytime running lights. The XC60 is the first of the 60 series to be based on the scalable product architecture, following the example of its big brother, the XC90. The new compact SUV comes with a complete range of safety features and that's part of a greater plan. Emmanuel knows Volvo has set itself an ambitious goal. From the year 2020 on, there are to be no more deaths or severe injuries in accidents involving a new Volvo. And to achieve it, they've been working flat out on various systems for active, passive and preventative safety. New and updated driver assists support the driver in steering and avoiding collisions. The blind spot information system, for example, if the driver fails to spot a vehicle in the blind spot, ignores the warnings and starts to move into the other vehicle's lane, the Volvo gently steers itself back into its own lane, even if the driver had signalled beforehand, which would normally deactivate the lane-keeping aid. If, in spite of all the safety features, an accident does happen, the car's occupants are protected in a passenger compartment reinforced with boron steel. Video of a rolling car shows just how strong the cabin structure is. Outside, just like its bigger and smaller stablemates, the new XC60 shows Volvo's current face with its distinctive grille. The five-seater is not quite 4.7 metres long. The trunk's capacity can be expanded from 505 to 1455 litres. The luxury aspect becomes apparent in the interior. All the materials are high quality and the workmanship flawless. All the available engines are paired with an 8-speed automatic transmission. The ventilated Napa leather comfort seats cost about 2,000 euros extra. Emmanuel notes that the display isn't horizontally oriented, as in most cars, but vertically. It doesn't make that much difference for the infotainment system, but it does for the air vents. Normally they would put out a band of air that you could adjust to hit you in the face or chest or elsewhere. But with the vents placed vertically, he gets the stream of air along the length of his body, which he finds very pleasant. Also pleasant is the ample legroom in the back seats. Five engines are available for the XC60, two gasoline-powered, two diesels and the plug-in hybrid we tested. A twin engine putting out 300 kilowatts. It carries the Volvo from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in just 5.3 seconds. Average fuel consumption is rated at 2.1 litres per 100 kilometres. 
What Emmanuel really likes about the XC60, aside from its design, is the generous standard equipment. And the touch of luxury has also taken a big step upward. And if that's not enough, there's a more than satisfactory list of options, but they'll push the price up really fast. A new Volvo XC60 can be had for anywhere from 48 to 80,000 euros in Germany. If there is something beyond the luxury car, it's this electric prototype Mercedes Maybach 6 convertible. Strictly electric, 550 kilowatts of power and a planned range of 500 kilometers. A rapid charging function stores enough energy in just five minutes to travel 100 kilometers. The design is reminiscent of a yacht. BMW presents the sixth generation of the M5 Sports sedan. For the first time, it has all-wheel drive to improve its dynamics and everyday utility. The M5 accelerates to 100 in just 3.4 seconds. The optional M Drivers package bumps the top speed up from 250 to 305 kilometers an hour. You might think manufacturing a car is a swift process. Press, bend, weld a few pieces of sheet metal, add some lacquer and a suspension and voila, your wheels can roll. But things aren't quite that simple. Before the actual manufacturing process begins, there's lots and lots of preparation. It all starts with the design. How should the car look? and what combinations of materials and colors should be used. To avoid building a separate prototype for each variant of a model, SEAT uses virtual models that everyone involved can view from all sides. It's not only paint, says Javier Diaz, head of SEAT's prototype center. It's also fabric, leather, everything. The Azza's department works day in, day out to ensure customer satisfaction. Once the decision makers agree on what they want, the first physical prototypes are built. But here too, modern technology makes it possible to experience the car in a different way. These sensors connect reality with virtual surroundings. Javier Diaz says most people think virtual reality glasses just came out two or three years ago, but SEAT has been using them for a long time. This pair was the company's first generation in 2003. They were very heavy, but developers could view the car in virtual reality. Sensors created a detailed image of the car. In the meantime, the technology has made big strides and plays an ever more important role. Designing with virtual reality saves time and money. But, uh, the most important thing of this virtual tool is that when you are immersive, you can check all the process uh, in the same way that it will be in the physic uh, pro uh, process. You can see the point of view of the worker, you can see how is the manipulation of the part, how is the ergonomy in the assembly, during the assembly of this prototype, and you can check every problem very soon in the virtual phase, and so you avoid to it, uh, find this problem later in the physical prototype. But design isn't everything. Material quality is crucial too. So various parts of the car are tested in various ways. For safety, it's important to X-ray wheel rims. We, we don't analyze every part, but all reference we produce here, uh, we, they are in the car, we analyze. What looks like a chest freezer is a chest freezer, or more precisely, a climate chest that creates various temperatures and humidity levels so materials can be tested under simulations of harsh conditions. Before the, before the start of the test, we perform 
cuts and incisions in the painting of the wheel in order to, to make the metal clear and the corrosion starts and we, and we measure the advance of the corrosion. We have uh, the measures and, and standards that says how much the corrosion must, uh, must advance in our wheels for 10 days in the chamber test. But water, dirt, road salt and curbs aren't the only stresses placed on a car's exterior. There's also plain old sunlight. To achieve good material durability, samples are exposed to powerful ultraviolet light for several weeks. We wouldn't want the car's lacquer to discolour or become brittle. We want that the car be OK during 10 years. This means that this uh, test is really important to be sure that the degradation is not happening in the car. Then, fine, it's OK. We can continue the test, but it looks, looks quite, quite good. So back in goes the sample, and back on go the lights. Light is also the tool in the lab one storey higher. Here, a scanning electron microscope is used to find tiny irregularities in lacquer samples. It's important to check the uniformity of, the, of this layer and the size because this will be, uh, give addition for all of the other layers. The paint has six layers in total and will also prevent from the corrosion the final product. After all these tests, a new vehicle with a new paint recipe and newly designed wheel rims is ready for the toughest quality control test of all. Once drivers take the car out on the road. Compact sedans are rare in Germany, says car tester Ronnie Lefstek, but Honda still offers the Civic as a sedan because it's retired the Accord. Now we'll take Honda's mid-range sedan for a spin. This is the 10th generation of the Civic that Honda's engineers have put on the road. 6.3 million Civics have been sold since 1973, and today the car is built in nine plants across the world. The new version is 10 centimetres longer and 4.5 centimetres wider than its predecessor. Little else has changed. Ronnie says the Civic sedan is based on the compact platform but has a much smoother ride than the hatchback variant. It's just as agile but won't shake you up as much on uneven road surfaces. Give the credit to the variable steering ratio, says Ronnie. It's like in the hybrid super sports car. Honda's NSX, a driver's dream. The steering wheel provides a stable zero-point position, direct response and good feedback. Only one engine is available for the Civic sedan, a 1.5-litre, 134-kilowatt turbo gasoline engine. At 1,800 RPM, the frisky powertrain already puts 240 newton metres of torque on the crankshaft and keeps going up to 5,500 RPM. So the Civic sprints from 0 to 100 in 8.2 seconds, if you use the manual six-speed transmission. The optional CVT automatic transmission accelerates a little more slowly. The sedan takes its technology and comfort features from the hatchback, and apart from being 13 centimetres longer and having a sedan form, it looks a lot like the hatchback. In front, the sedan sports a broad chrome bar where the classic Civic has a black panel and oversized honeycomb air intakes. The conspicuous C-shaped tail lights give the car's rear a well-integrated appearance. Honda calls this version of the Civic a notchback sedan, says Ronnie. But where is the notch? These flowing lines make it look more like a coupe. 
Und nun kommen wir zum Kofferraum. And now for a look Ein in the Nachteil trunk. Bei so einer Linie One disadvantage of such lines is that they greatly restrict the size of the lid, making it harder to load the trunk. But the trunk's volume is quite adequate. Ronnie just wishes the lid were bigger. If you fold down the back seat, storage space increases from 500 to a spacious 1,200 liters. The interior is identical to that of the hatchback variant. The seats contribute to the car's sporty impression. Ronnie says the Honda Civic sedan is shorter than the Accord, but the new Civic generation is bigger than its predecessor, and so it fills a gap. Ronnie judges that the Civic sedan will appeal to many drivers. Opel is offering a sporty equipment package for its city car, the Adam, the Adam S. Car tester Michel Assenmacher is going to take a closer look. Michel describes the Opel Adam as a bubble car, solid and amicable. But the Opel Adam S has a meaner look, a lower ride and an almost racy rear spoiler. Now she's going to see if it lives up to its promises. Many details tell the attentive observer that the S has the makings of a sports car. The badging, exhaust and the black alloy wheels all combine to give the Adam S a look all of its own. Michelle knows the Opel Adam as a stylish mini car and a favourite among women, but the Opel Adam S comes across like a sporty twin brother, a product of the Opel Performance Centre. Adam S's specs are also decent. The engine's 110 kilowatts push the city car from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 8.5 seconds, reaching a top speed of 210. But the gear shift throw is a bit too long for Michelle and the steering wheel a bit too large. She would have preferred it even tighter and sportier. She has no complaints about the handling. The special sport-tuned chassis takes the Adam S into and around curves smoothly. The car's curb weight of under 1.2 tonnes helps make it even more dynamic, with the high-performance braking system keeping it well under control. Michelle thinks Opel has designed the interior just as impressively as the exterior. In particular, she likes the roof liner. The chequered flag pattern eggs the driver on to cross the finish line and win the race. Red accents inside pick up on the same colours outside. The instrument cluster screams, sports car, all the way. The Recaro seats keep a firm grip on the driver and passenger. The Adam S's width of not quite two meters, including the mirrors, is no different from its siblings, letting it slip easily down narrow lanes and alleys. Its length is almost the same, so the S is also easy to park. At the rear, the spoiler, diffuser and chrome sports exhaust maintain the sports car styling. All versions of the Adam have the same trunk capacity ranging from 170 to a decent 660 litres with the rear seats folded down. The 1.4 litre turbo gasoline burner is reserved for the S version of the Adam and the S version of the Adam Rocks variant. Michelle's having real fun in this sporty city car, saying it's not just the looks. It reminds her of a go-kart and not of some outsized child's pedal-driven car. But Michelle does have one criticism. She'd appreciate a bit more sound in the Opel Adam S, a somewhat brawnier tone to go with the somewhat meaner look. But at least the neighbours won't miss that additional sound. And if it's that important to the buyers, 
They ought to be able to find a sports exhaust system at an accessory shop. So, what is Michelle's bottom line? She would have expected more sportiness from the Opel Adam S, but then it's meant as the Adam's sporty version, not an Opel Performance Center model. Its interior is cozy and its handling comfortable, making it a good city car, but more fun than the regular Adam. But with its starting price of nearly 12,000 euros, it costs over 7,000 euros more than the entry-level Adam. That's a 60% price hike. Next time on Drive It, a sporty double. The Audi SQ5. And we test the Jaguar F-Type 400 Sport.